you so much for inviting me back. I've thoroughly enjoyed last time I came here, and I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful time again this morning. I wonder if I could have a couple of volunteers. Are there any children in the room? Uh, especially those who like sports. Uh, yeah, come on, you can come up as well. That'd be great. That's good. Okay, you can do something over here. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing something completely different to what I would have planned. Um, but if we start over here, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to mimic a race. No, you're important part of this, actually, yeah. Um, does anybody remember there was a, a race in the Olympic Games back in Barcelona? A guy named Derek Redmond. Do you remember that? We're going to try and reenact this as a good visual for the children. So what we're going to do, we're going to race, all right? Um, probably best not to, maybe that's our finishing line, okay? Now, who wants to be Derek Redmond? Okay, you'll be Derek Redmond, yeah? Okay, so he's the star of the show, all right? You'll go back there, you'll go back there, all right? You're in the crowd. You're going to... All right, now you two come inside. All right, now we're going to have a race, right? And see who can get past that line when I say three, two, one, go. But you're going to have a, oh, my leg hurts. And then you're going to fall to the floor, okay? Maybe. <laughs> okay, so three, two, one, go. Oh! Oh, he was in the lane. Son, son, you can do it. Okay, now Derek Redmond, <laughs> Derek Redmond, he said, it's okay, son, you can just let it go. And he's like, no, I'm going to finish this race. And then his father said, okay, then, then we will do it together. And then he takes him across the finish. <laughs> It's just one message through this, like the analogy in the Bible, that's a big word analogy, it's like a picture of the Bible says that life is like a race, yeah, and sometimes, yeah, we might feel like we can't finish the race because we get injured in some way, but you see, just as Jim Redman picked his son up and helped him across the line, that's what God does for us, Jesus will help you in the race of life. So whatever you're going through, you might struggle at school with some things, maybe bullying or, or your homework is tough, isn't it? Those things are tough to do, but it's like a race. Remember, Jesus is the one who will help you every step of the way. Yeah? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Yeah? Father, we thank you for these wonderful children. Thank you for our Derek Redmond. He's a brilliant actor. Lord. We pray, Father, your blessing upon them. Pray, Lord, that you would raise all the children up, Lord, to honour you, to love you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, and we pray your special protection over them and their families, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then don't look back. <laughs> um, I just want to pray before I, I speak. I thank you for your prayers. But I always need to pray to show my dependence upon the Lord. So, Father, we just come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I take the promised Holy Spirit, thanking you that he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Father, we pray that you'd open up our hearts and give us a revelation of your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, this passage is been taken from Luke chapter 9 and I'll read as we go along but I've titled this Don't Look Back because I have really believed and really sensed that this week and perhaps the week before that is not only do we need to come to Jesus if we're not saved but there might be many of us who need to come back and be fully committed to the Lord. So really it's don't look back, but the message is come to me, come to me. And in this passage, there are three men and Jesus basically tells them all roughly the same thing that they need to follow him with all of their heart. So let us read 
uh, together. As they were walking along, the, this is the first man, by the way, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, boxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. The first message is that is this, the path might not always be easy. I don't know if uh, you have the same here, I should imagine you do, but in Watford we can see lots of foxes running across the road. In fact, we had a little baby fox in our garden who come and stole one of our cleaning cloths. And sometimes in the night, when, especially when we had a dog, with lots of toys in the garden, we'd often hear the squeaking as the foxes are playing with the toys. They're tremendous creatures, aren't they? But we're reminded, aren't we? I did a little search here. I think I put it up there. There we go. Uh, the foxes have dens. They have somewhere to rest. They have somewhere to sleep. And likewise, birds, in a sense, they have somewhere to rest too. We had a bird lay some eggs in one of our plant, plant pots in the garden. It all happens in our garden, um, but it's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? But Jesus says the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Does that mean that Jesus never had somewhere to rest his head? That's not the case because we know he had friends to stay at at times, Peter's mothers. We know that he stayed at Mary's and Lazarus, and he had somewhere to lay his head. But I think what he means is that we must be prepared to go wherever the will of God is, even if it means being uncomfortable. The right path is not always the e easiest path, is it? And then we come to another thing that Jesus taught was the difference between the narrow road and the broad path. The narrow road is easy to get on, but it's difficult to navigate. It's difficult to continue on. The broad road is easy to get on, but it's also very easy to continue on. But Jesus says difficult is the narrow road, and few find it. But the broad road is the easy road, but leads to destruction. So I say this, it's easy to start the journey, isn't it? Because that's what we do. We put our faith in Christ, but it's not easy to finish the journey. And that's where we're going with this. Jesus also told the parable of the sower. Uh, we're not going to go too much in, into this, but the things that stop people from on that, that narrow path were, one is persecution, the other are the cares of the world, the other is the work of Satan in people's lives. Sorry, I'm just going to get that water. Sorry, I should have brought it up with me. I had two friends, actually. One of them was a teacher of the gospel, a teacher of the Bible who shared the gospel with me. He was the first to share the gospel with me. And that was the seed that was planted in me, which transformed me. Uh, funnily enough, he ended up marrying someone who wasn't a Christian and he's no longer following on that narrow path. In fact, he's teaching heresy and all sorts of strange things. <laughs> Another is an evangelist who came and joined the ministry and he was the most amazing evangelist I have ever seen. He would have bouncers in nightclubs in groups praying for them. That's the type of guy he was. He was a bit of a rascal. The church didn't like him because he was always getting homeless people praying in large groups of 20. He also went away because he found that that path was too difficult. Um, pray for him. I won't mention his name. I don't think it's right to do that. But pray for both of them that they would come back on that path. It's the same message, isn't it? It's not too late. Come to me. But Jesus said there is a cost to discipleship. It's not an easy message, is it? He used the analogy of building a tower. Who on earth plans to build a tower but not realize they don't have the resources to finish it? We don't do that, do we? We must make sure that we have the materials. Here we go, Lego. 
and the resources to finish building what we started. Jesus said, actually, in this same chapter in Luke chapter 9, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself and what? Take up his cross. Sounds a bit harsh. I've not heard many people preach on this, but it's true. Jesus often mentioned this. So here we are, the, the, the path that Jesus sets us on. We must be willing to be a bit uncomfortable for the Lord. And this man wanted to follow Jesus, but he wasn't prepared to leave the comfort of his own home and enter into the uh, unpredictability of the kingdom living life. <laughs> Are you willing to get a bit uncomfortable for Jesus? Not many shout amen. Maybe I'll ask that again. Are you willing to be a little bit uncomfortable for Jesus? Okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. He can make us uncomfortable, but it's a blessed life, isn't it? That's the first man. He wasn't willing. He wasn't willing to have what it takes to follow the Lord. The second man here says this, says he said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So the second point is there is a sense of urgency, isn't there, to the calling of Christ on your life. Now, I don't think this text, in fact, I'm absolutely convinced this text doesn't mean to say that if you get saved, you're not to worry about preparing your family's funeral if one should die. Of course not. That's not what he's saying. I think what Jesus is alluding to here is that this man's father was probably old, but not yet dead. Perhaps time was uh, at any moment this man could have passed, but he wanted to go and be there for when his father died. So there's, in a sense, it was an excuse to say, actually, I'm not quite prepared to follow you. There's things I have to do before I come. <laughs> And follow you, Lord. And how many of us make excuses in life? I know so many people who don't know the Lord and I've shared with them the gospel and they make excuse after excuse. And many do believe, don't they, that they can put off salvation for another time. One of my family members is saying, I'm just going to wait for the plane to go down. And then I'll say, Lord, save me. I'm like, mm, doesn't quite work like that. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. And you don't know what tomorrow brings. Now, I had a bit of a shock, but I was so blessed of the news. It was actually my daughter phoned me and said she got knocked off a bike. Now, thankfully, she something told her to go back and put all of her gear on. And that's what she did. And I was like, that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> But she got knocked off at a roundabout and went flying down the road. Now, she had whiplash and concussion, but thankfully she was alive. I just thought in that moment that could have been a very different phone call. And that uh, is a plead to you. If there's anybody in here who hasn't received that call from Jesus, come to me. He's saying that to you now. Don't put it off because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. There is a sense of urgency in the gospel call don't put it off you might not get another chance but the second thing i wanted to say is that many of us who have given our life to jesus have in fact put off being fully committed to him i, I put my hand up in some way to that and some of us at different stages in our lives we perhaps are not in the place where we want to be i bet you if i sh ask for a show of hands i'm not going <laughs> to If I said, are you in the place where you really want to be at this moment? Most people would say, no, I'm not. But the call is to come to me and seek me with all of your heart. The Lord says, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. Now, I've also never heard a sermon on the book of Revelation, the churches in Asia Minor. And I love these letters. It's like a litmus test for our spirituality in the church. And the emphasis is, is quite beautiful because Jesus shows his jealous longing for affection for his church. I love that. 
I can never get my head around the fact that the God, that everything was created by him, for him and through him, the God of this universe wants our affection. Can you believe that? Like, it is just mind-blowing. If we really, truly believed that, then, of course, why wouldn't we spend time in his wonderful presence? We see that in the, the Ephesian, the church in Ephesus, Jesus referred to them, actually, in uh, Paul referred to them as the faithful. And then in, we see later in Exodus, sorry, Ephesus 6, it says, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. So you see, at one moment, the church at Ephesus really loved the Lord with an undying love. And then we see Jesus rebuking them, saying, you've lost your first love. So he's he's that calling. Come back to me. Put me first. Love me more than anything else. That was his message to them. And we also see the church in Sardis. Jesus rebuked them for being a dead church, even though they had an appearance of being alive. This is quite challenging, isn't it? Because in a church, we can have a show of spirituality with lots of activities and things going on. But where the rubber hits the road is, do we have a deep and meaningful, prayerful, beautiful relationship with God? So we can have activities, but no prayer life. Of course, both are very, very important. And then we also have Laodicea. Does anyone know what Jesus called the Laodiceans? <laughs> Lukewarm, that's right. He said, you're neither hot nor cold. You're somewhere in the middle. And it's, oh, I won't repeat what he said to them. So what he's saying is, I want you to be hot for me. I want you to put me first with all of your heart. And I think many of us can put off being fully committed to the Lord. And I think sometimes we all fall in that camp at different stages of our life. I believe that the Apostle Paul was fully committed to God and fully committed to run that race because he referred to this third person, which was him, that was caught up into the heavenly. He saw things that weren't repeatable. So when he come back, he's saying, actually, this radically changed his life. He was fully committed. And there is a sense of urgency for us now to come back to the Lord, to be fully committed to him. It's never too late. I, I said this the other day. It was, it's not that the Lord has left us. It's that sometimes we leave the Lord. It's not that the Lord isn't there wanting to spend time with you. Is that we oftentimes don't want to spend time with the Lord. Isn't that comforting to know that the Lord is always there saying, come to me, knocking on the door, just open, I'll come dine with you. I think that's just a wonderful, wonderful picture. <clears throat> so the second message is that if you do know the Lord and perhaps you're in that place where you haven't put him first and, you know, we, I'm always wanting to come back to the place where I want more of the Lord each day. He is there with open arms. And maybe someone needs to hear that this morning. That's the second man. And the third man, it says here, still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts their hands to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Do you think this man was double minded? Maybe he had a desire to follow the Lord, but he has his eyes on his old life. Now, Jesus was familiar with the Old Testament picture. Remember Elijah and Elisha, where Elijah went and called Elisha to follow him. Elisha asked, didn't he, if I could go back and kiss my parents. And Elijah permitted it. Now, he didn't finish plowing his field, but what he did instead, he slaughtered the oxen, burned his equipment to cook the meat, and then he gave it to all of the people. That's a nice thing to do, isn't it? And then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. So here he was once plowing the fields. Now he set his hands to a different plow to serve God. And we saw God powerfully used Elijah, but he also 
powerfully used Elisha in such an amazing way. He's put his hands to a different plow and now he's following the prophets. But this third man that Jesus is referring to, he kind of had one hand potentially on the plow, one eye towards Jesus and the other one looking back. He liked the idea of following Jesus, but he, he wasn't willing to let go of his past life. Many of us, I think, are like that. We have one hand on the plow and one hand on our old life, one eye going forward, the other back. I don't know if anybody's tried to run a race by looking back. It's an impossible feat, isn't it? And we were doing a study on James and in our Bible study and it says in James chapter four that friendship with the world is enmity against God. And in this passage, Jesus is showing that their spirituality is that we want to ask God for things that we can spend on our own pleasure. So they're, they're coming to God for the wrong motives. They have one foot in the kingdom, one foot in the world. Jesus himself said, he who loves the world, what did he reply? The love of the Father is not in them. Now, does this mean, if we're not to love the world, does this mean we have to stop being friends with people outside the church? <laughs> of course not. In fact, Jesus was referred as a friend of sinners. But what it does mean is that we're not to get caught up in the same pleasures of the world like we used to. My goodness, here's a bit of honesty. When I first got saved, I remember, I shared this in our life group, I remember walking past a nightclub, everybody was drinking and having fun in the garden. And I remember the time, my old life, where that's where I used to come out early in the evening and enjoy drinking. And it was this sense of, oh, I really miss that. That was early in my faith, by the way. And I was on the, I was on the way to a homeless meeting, but you could see now that God transformed me, at my idea of a nice day out, as Gary Barlow said, is, is actually a prayer meeting rather than drinking in a nightclub. You can see how God gets hold of someone and radically transforms them. We are to be a different type of people now we have come to Jesus. That's not to say that we don't enjoy good things and have friends outside the church. Of course, we need to do that. But they need someone to look to, something to adhere to, some, some light to be attracted to, and that is the church. Now, it all sounds a bit challenging and harsh, doesn't it? But actually, the point is we cannot, and I repeat, we cannot do this without Jesus' help. As you've seen in the earlier picture that Derek Redmond amazingly acted out. And here we come to the plowing of Jesus. Jesus had both hands on the plow. If you think what Jesus field was, my goodness, it was the Passion Week, ultimately leading to his death on the cross. I'm not sure any of us would like that in our field. That wouldn't be the place where we would like to plow, of course. And he headed straight to the cross. And he did that to pay for those one-handed, backward-looking, bad-plowing Christians that we are. But realistically, Jesus was the only one who could ever put his hands, both hands, fully to the plow and never look back. And he freely gives you his labors. He gives them to you. He calls you to come to him and take his yoke upon you. You can see here that um, when an oxen plows a field, there's these two of them working in motion in order to plow up that hard ground. Jesus is saying, actually, you need to come to me, take my yoke, get in, and I will do the plowing for you. That's wonderful, isn't it? He takes our bad work and gives us his perfect work. Hallelujah. We are in ourselves, aren't we? Half-hearted plowers and unfit, but the gospel speaks another word. There is one who set his face towards Jerusalem. He has plowed and his work is perfect. Praise the Lord. And it says... Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, 
he endured the cross, scoring, scorning at shame and sat down at the right hand of God. And that's the message, isn't it? If Jesus is saying, come to me, how much easier is it with him doing the plowing? How much easier is it walking on the path, this difficult path, with Jesus walking and helping you along the road? How much easier is it to run the race when we've got Jesus to look toward and that we can win this un incorruptible crown? How much easier is it to fight the good fight of faith when Jesus is the one in your corner? I have a friend who had written a book, Jesus in My Corner. He was a boxer. <laughs> and the interesting thing is when Paul is saying, I run the race, I fought the good fight. The one thing he says more than anything is that he kept the faith. So I'm not talking about works here. I'm not talking about going out, showing how wonderfully godly you are. That's a brilliant thing to do. Running the race, fighting the good fight, walking the path is simply holding on to the Lord, yielding to the Lord, getting in his yoke and letting him pull you along. That sounds like a better option to me than me trying to do it myself and in philippians 3 it says but one thing i do forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead i press on toward the goal to win the prize which god has called me heavenward in christ jesus i've only got a couple of more minutes just to close but the closing message is this that if you are in that place where you've taken your hand off the plow it's urgent, but it's never too late. God will never abandon you. Some of us might have strayed. Some of us might have looked back. Some of us may have gone off course. But the Holy Spirit showed me so clearly that someone in this room might think it's too late for them or game over. That's not the case. Today, God has given you another opportunity to come to him and to get in the yoke with him and move forward. I want you to hear that, whoever that's for. Today, God is offering you a fresh start, a new chapter, actually a new book, praise the Lord, a new book to write. Don't look back. Don't let your past influence your future. Jesus is saying to you this morning, come to me. Now, I'm going to read this song, which we went to. Does anybody know the Sisterhood of Mary? They're not far from here. Do you know, we went to my wife and I went to visit them yes, yesterday and we were so blessed by them. And I had this message on my heart already and they showed me a CD with the back with a song that says, come to me. And they, they played it to us, turned it up. And we just sat there. We listened to it. I thought, wow, this is a confirmation that right here, right now in this room, someone needs to hear that. Actually, I need to hear it. This message, I believe, is for me as well, not just us. So here I'm going to read it just to close, and then we can just sit, maybe just for a minute, silence, and I want maybe you can do business with the Lord as we do this. Come to me. My heart is open for you. Can't you see how I am waiting for you? Come to me, beloved. Come to me. My child, trust in me, in my love for you. Come to me, believe, come today. Come to me, I'll never turn away. A child in tears who brings me every fear. I came to earth to seek and save the lost. Come to me, weary and heavily laden, come to me. You who are sad and burdened, come to me. I'll never break the reed that's bruised or quenched the dimly burning wick. Come to me. Weighed down by sin and failure, come to me. I am your loving saviour, come to me. Your heart broken, ill mend, for I have suffered too, I understand. Come to me, my heart is open wide. Come to me, my child, in me abide. Come to me, here you can safely hide until the waves are calm and the storm has passed. Come to me, come in the darkness night, 
Trust in me and you will be, I will be your light. Come to me and you will hope again. For with me suffering never is the end.